God reveals the following to St. Bridget of Sweden. God's grievance concerning three men now going around in the world, and about how from the start God established three estates, namely those of the clergy, the defenders, and the laborers, and about the punishment prepared for the thankless, and about the glory given to the thankful. From Book Two, of Prophecies and Revelations of St. Bridget of Sweden. Chapter 20 The great host of heaven was seen, and God spoke to it, saying, Although you know and see all things in me, however, because it is my wish, I will state my complaint before you concerning three things. The first is that those lovely beehives, which were built in heaven from all eternity, and from which those worthless bees went out, are empty. The second is that the bottomless pit, against which neither rocks nor trees are of any help, stands ever open. Souls descend into it like snow falling from the sky down to earth. Just as the sun dissolves snow into water, so too souls are dissolved of every good by that terrible torment, and are renewed unto every punishment. My third complaint is that few people notice the fall of souls, or the empty dwellings from which the bad angels have strayed. I am therefore right to complain. I chose three men from the beginning. By this I am figuratively speaking of the three estates in the world. First, I chose a cleric to proclaim my will in his words and to demonstrate it in his actions. Second, I chose a defender to defend my friends with his own life and to be ready for any undertakings for my sake. Third, I chose a laborer to labor with his hands in order to provide bodily food through his work. The first man, that is, the clergy, has now become leprous and mute. Anyone who looks to see a fine and virtuous character in him shrinks back at the sight and shudders to approach him because of the leprosy of his pride and greed. When he wants to listen to him, the priest is mute about praising me, but a chatterbox in praising himself. So, how is the path to be opened that leads the way to great joy, if the one who should be leading the way is so weak? And if the one who should be proclaiming it is mute, how will that heavenly joy be heard of? The second man, the defender, trembles at heart, and his hands are idle. He trembles at causing scandal in the world and losing his reputation. His hands are idle in that he does not perform any holy works. Instead, everything he does, he does for the world. Who, then, will defend my people if the one who should be their leader is afraid? The third man is like an ass that lowers its head to the ground and stands with its four feet joined together. Sure, indeed, the people are like an ass that longs for nothing but things of the earth, which neglects the things of heaven and goes in search of perishable goods. They have four feet, since they have little faith, and their hope is idle. Third, they have no good works, and fourth, they are entirely intent upon sinning. This is why their mouth is always open for gluttony and greed. My friends, how can that endless yawning pit be reduced, or the honeycomb be filled by people such as these? God's mother replied, May you be blessed, my son. Your grievance is justified. Your friends and I have only one word of excuse for you to save the human race. It is this. Have mercy, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. This is my cry and the cry of your friends. The son replied, Your words are sweet to my ears. 
Their taste delights my mouth. They enter my heart with love. I do have a cleric, a defender, and a peasant. The first pleases me like a bride, whom an honest bridegroom yearns and longs for with divine love. His voice will be like the voice of a clamorous speech that echoes in the woods. The second will be ready to give his life for me, and will not fear the reproach of the world. I shall arm him with the weapons of my Holy Spirit. The third will have so firm a faith that he will say, I believe as firmly as if I saw what I believe. I hope for all the things God has promised. He will have the intention of doing good and growing in virtue and avoiding evil. In the first man's mouth I shall put three sayings for him to proclaim. His first proclamation will be, Let him who has faith put what he believes into practice. The second, Let him who has a firm hope be steadfast in every good work. The third, Let him who loves perfectly and with charity yearn fervently to see the object of his love. The second man will work like a strong lion, taking careful precautions against treachery and persevering steadfastly. The third man will be as wise as a serpent that stands on its tail and lifts its head to the skies. These three will carry out my will. Others will follow them. Although I speak of three, by them I mean many. Then he spoke to the bride, saying, Stand firm. Do not be concerned about the world or about its reproaches, for I, who heard every kind of reproach, am your God and your Lord. The words of the glorious virgin to her daughter about how Christ was taken down from the cross, and about her own bitterness and sweetness at the passion of her son, and about how the soul is symbolized by a virgin and the love of the world, and the love of God by two youths, and about the qualities the soul should have as a virgin. Chapter 21 Mary spoke. You should reflect on five things, my daughter. First, how every limb in my son's body grew stiff and cold at his death and how the blood that flowed from his wounds as he was suffering dried up and clung to each limb. Second, how his heart was pierced so bitterly and mercilessly that the man speared it until the lance hit a rib, and both parts of the heart were on the lance. Third, reflect on how he was taken down from the cross. The two men who took him down from the cross made use of three stepladders. One reached to his feet, the second just below his armpits and arms, the third the middle of his body. The first man got up and held him by the middle. The second, getting up on another ladder, first pulled a nail out of one arm, then moved the ladder and pulled the nail from the other hand. The nails extended through the crossbeam. The man who had been holding up the weight of the body then went down as slowly and carefully as he could, while the other man got up on the stepladder that went to the feet and pulled out the nails from the feet. When he was lowered to the ground, one of them held the body by the head and the other by the feet. I, his mother, held him about the waist, and so the three of us carried him to a rock that I had covered with a clean sheet, and in that we wrapped his body. I did not sew the sheet together, because I knew that he would not decay in the grave. After that came Mary Magdalene and the other holy women. Angels, too, as many as the atoms of the sun, were there, showing their allegiance to their Creator, None can tell what sorrow I had at the time. I was like a woman giving birth who shakes in every limb of her body after delivery. Although she can scarcely breathe due to the pain, she still rejoices inwardly as much as she can because she knows that the child she has given birth to 
will never return to the same painful ordeal he has just left. In the same way, although no sorrow could compare with my sorrow over the death of my son, still I rejoiced in my soul, because I knew my son would no longer die, but would live for ever. Thus my sorrow was mixed with a measure of joy. I can truly say that there were two hearts in the one grave where my son was buried. Is it not said, Where your treasure is, there is your heart as well. Likewise, my heart and mind were constantly going to my son's grave. Then the mother of God went on to say, I shall describe this man by way of a metaphor, how he was situated, and in what kind of state, and what his present situation is like. It is as though a virgin was betrothed to a man, and two youths were standing before her. One of them, having been addressed by the virgin, said to her, I advise you not to trust the man to whom you are betrothed. He is unbending in his actions, tardy in payment, miserly in giving gifts. Rather, put your trust in me, and in the words I speak to you, and I shall show you another man, who is not hard but gentle in every way, who gives you what you want right away, and gives you plenty of pleasant and delightful gifts. The virgin, hearing this and thinking about it to herself, answered, Your words are good to hear. You yourself are gentle and attractive to my eyes. I think I will follow your advice. When she took off her ring in order to give it to the youth, she saw three sayings inscribed on it. The first was, When you come to the top of the tree, beware lest you lay hold of a dry branch of the tree to support yourself and fall. The second saying was, Beware lest you take advice from an enemy. The third saying was, Place not your heart between the teeth of a lion. When the virgin saw these sayings, she pulled her hand back and held on to the ring, thinking to herself, These three sayings I see may perhaps mean that this man who wants to have me as his bride is not to be trusted. It seems to me that his words are empty. He is full of hatred and will kill me. While she was thinking this, she looked again and noticed another inscription that also had three sayings. The first saying was, Give to the one who gives to you. The second saying was, Give blood for blood. The third saying was, Take not from the owner what belongs to him. When the virgin saw and heard this, she thought again to herself, the first three sayings inform me how I can escape death, the other three how I can obtain life. Therefore, it is right for me to follow the words of life. Then the virgin prudently summoned to herself the servant of the man to whom she had first been betrothed. When he came, the man who wanted to deceive her withdrew from them. So it is with the soul of that person who was betrothed to God. The two youths standing before the soul represent the friendship of God and the friendship of the world. The friends of the world have come closer to him up until now. They spoke to him of worldly riches and glory, and he almost gave the ring of his love to them and consented to them in every way. But by the aid of my son's grace, he saw an inscription, that is, he heard the words of his mercy, and understood three things through them. First, that he should beware lest, the higher he rose, and the more he relied on perishable things, the worse would be the fall that threatened him. Second, he understood that there was nothing in the world but sorrow and care. Third, that his reward from the devil would be evil. Then he saw another inscription. I mean, he heard its consoling messages. The first message was that he should give his possessions to God, from whom he had received them all. The second was that he should render the service of his own body to the man who had shed his blood for him. 
the third was that he should not alienate his soul from God, who had created and redeemed it. Now that he has heard and carefully considered these things, God's servants approach him, and he is pleased with them, and the servants of the world draw away from him. His soul is now like a virgin who has risen fresh from the arms of her bridegroom, and who ought to have three things. First, she should have fine clothes, so as not to be laughed at by the royal maidservants, should some defect be noticed in her clothes. Second, she should comply with the will of her bridegroom, so as not to cause him any dishonor on her account, should anything dishonorable be discovered in her actions. Third, she should be completely clean, lest the bridegroom discover in her any stain, because of which he might scorn or repudiate her. Let her also have people to guide her to the bridegroom's suite, so as not to lose her way about the precincts or in the elaborate entrance. A guide should have two characteristics. First, the person following him should be able to see him. Second, one should be able to hear his directions and where he steps. A person following another who leads the way should have three characteristics. First, he should not be slow and sluggish in following. Second, he should not hide himself from the person leading the way. Third, he should pay close attention and watch the footsteps of his guide and follow him eagerly. Thus, in order that his soul may reach the suite of the bridegroom, it is necessary that it be guided by the kind of guide who can successfully lead it to God, his bridegroom. The Blessed Mother's Teaching on Spiritual Wisdom In a mystical vision given to St. Bridget of Sweden, the Holy Virgin reveals the following. The Glorious Virgin's Doctrinal Teaching to Her Daughter About Spiritual and Temporal Wisdom And About Which of Them One Ought to Imitate And About How Spiritual Wisdom Leads a Person to Everlasting Consolation after a little struggle, while temporal wisdom leads to eternal damnation. This Virgo Putens production comes from Book 2, Chapters 22 to 23, from Prophecies and Revelations by St. Bridget of Sweden. Chapter 22 Mary spoke, It is written, that if you would be wise, you should learn wisdom from a wise person. Accordingly, I give you the figurative example of a man who wanted to learn wisdom, and saw two teachings standing before him. He said to them, I would really like to learn wisdom, if only I knew where it would lead me, and of what use and purpose it is. One of the teachers answered, if you would follow my wisdom, it will lead you up a high mountain along a path that is hard and rocky underfoot, steep and difficult to climb. If you struggle for this wisdom, you will gain something that is dark on the outside but shining on the inside. If you hold on to it, you will secure your desire. Like a circle that spins around, it will draw you to itself more and more, sweetly and ever more sweetly, until, in time, you are imbued with happiness from every side. The second teacher said, If you follow my wisdom, it will lead you to a lush and beautiful valley with the fruits of every land. The path is soft underfoot, and the descent is little trouble. If you persevere in this wisdom, you will gain something that is shiny on the outside, but when you want to use it, it will fly away from you. You will also have something that does not last, but ends suddenly. A book, too, once you have read it through to the end, ceases to exist along with the act of reading, and you are left idle. 
When the man heard this, he thought to himself, I hear two amazing things. If I climb up the mountain, my feet get weak and my back grows heavy. Then, if I do obtain the thing that is dark on the outside, what good will it do me? If I struggle for something that has no end, when will there be any consolation for me? The other teacher promises something that is radiant on the outside, but does not last, a kind of wisdom that will end with the reading of it. What use do I have of things with no stability? While he was thinking this in his mind, suddenly another man appeared between the two teachers and said, Although the mountain is high and difficult to climb, nevertheless there is a bright cloud above the mountain that will give you comfort. If the promised container that is dark on the outside can somehow be broken, you will get the gold that is concealed within, and you will be in happy possession of it forever. These two teachers are two kinds of wisdom, namely the wisdom of the spirit and the wisdom of the flesh. The spiritual kind involves giving up your self-will for God and aspiring to the things of heaven with your every desire and action. It cannot be truly called wisdom if your actions do not accord with your words. This kind of wisdom leads to a blessed life, but it involves a rocky approach and a steep climb, inasmuch as resisting your passions seems a hard and rocky way. It involves a steep climb to spurn habitual pleasures and not to love worldly honors. Although it is difficult, Yet, for the person who reflects on how little time there is, and how the world will end, and who fixes his mind constantly on God, above the mountain there will appear a cloud, that is, the consolation of the Holy Spirit. A person worthy of the Holy Spirit's consolation is one who seeks no other consoler but God. How would all the elect have undertaken such hard and arduous tasks if God's Spirit had not cooperated with their good will as with a good instrument? Their good will drew this Spirit to them, and the divine love they had for God invited it. For they struggled with heart and will until they were made strong in works. They won the consolation of the Spirit, and also soon obtained the gold of divine delight and love that not only made them able to bear a great many adversities, but also made them rejoice in bearing them, as they thought of their reward. Such rejoicing seems dark to the lovers of this world, for they love darkness. But to the lovers of God, it is brighter than the sun, and shines more than gold. For they break through the darkness of their vices, and climb the mountain of patience, contemplating the cloud of that consolation that never ends, but begins in the present, and spins like a circle, until it reaches perfection. Worldly wisdom leads to a valley of misery that seems lush in its plenty, beautiful in reputation, soft in luxury. This kind of wisdom will end swiftly, and offers no further benefit beyond what it used to see and hear. Therefore, my daughter, seek wisdom from the wise one, I mean, from my son. He is wisdom itself, from whom all wisdom comes. He is the circle that never ends. I entreat you as a mother does her child. Love the wisdom that is like gold on the inside, but contemptible on the outside, that burns inside with love, but requires effort on the outside, and bears fruit through its works. If you worry about the burden of it all, God's Spirit will be your consoler. Go, keep on trying like someone who keeps going, on until the habit is acquired. Do not turn back until you reach the peak of the mountain. There is nothing so difficult that it does not become easy through steadfast and intelligent perseverance. 
there is no pursuit so noble at the outset that it does not fall into darkness by not being brought to completion. Advance, then, toward spiritual wisdom. It will lead you to physical toil, to despising the world, to a little pain, and to everlasting consolation. But worldly wisdom is deceitful and conceals a sting. It will lead you to the hoarding of temporary goods and to present prestige, but, in the end, to the greatest unhappiness, unless you are wary and take careful precautions. The Glorious Virgin's Words Explaining Her Humility to Her Daughter and about how humility is likened to a cloak, and about the characteristics of true humility and its wonderful fruits. Chapter 23 Many people wonder why I speak with you. It is, of course, to show my humility. If a member of the body is sick, the heart is not content until it has regained its health and once its health is restored, the heart is all the more gladdened. In the same way, however, much a person may sin, if he turns back to me with all his heart and a true purpose of amendment, I am immediately prepared to welcome him when he comes. Nor do I pay attention to how much he may have sinned, but to the intention and purpose he has when he returns. Everyone calls me, Mother of mercy. Truly, my daughter, the mercy of my Son has made me merciful, and the disclosure of his mercy has made me compassionate. For that reason, that person is miserable who, when she or he is able, does not have recourse to mercy. Come, therefore, my daughter, and hide yourself beneath my cloak. My cloak is contemptible on the outside, but very useful on the inside, for three reasons. First, it shelters you from the stormy winds. Second, it protects you from burning cold. Third, it defends you against the rain showers from the sky. This cloak is my humility. The lovers of the world hold this in contempt and think that imitating it is a silly superstition. What is more contemptible than to be called an idiot, and not to get angry or answer in kind? What is more despicable than the giving up of everything, and being in every way poor? What seems sorrier to worldly souls than to conceal one's own pain, and to think and believe oneself unworthier and lowlier than everyone else? Such was my humility, my daughter. This was my joy, this my one desire. I only thought of how to please my son. This humility of mine was useful for those who followed me in three ways. First, it was useful in pestilent and stormy weather, that is, against human taunts and scorn. A powerful and violent storm wind pounds a person from all directions and makes him freeze. In the same way, Taunting easily crushes an impatient person who does not reflect on future realities. It drives the soul away from charity. Anyone carefully studying my humility should consider the kinds of things I, the Queen of the Universe, had to hear, and so should seek my praise and not his own. Let him recall that words are nothing but air, and he will soon grow calm. Why are worldly people so unable to put up with verbal taunts, if not because they seek their own praise rather than God's? There is no humility in them, because their eyes are made bleary by sin. Therefore, although the written law says one should not without due cause give one's ear to insulting speech or put up with it, Still, it is a virtue and a prize to listen patiently to, and put up with insults for the sake of God. Second, my humility is a protection from the burning cold, that is, from carnal friendship. 
for there is a kind of friendship in which a person is loved for the sake of present commodities, like those who speak in this way. Feed me for the present, and I will feed you, for it is no concern of mine who feeds you after death. Give me respect, and I will respect you, for it does not concern me in the least what kind of future respect there is to come. This is a cold friendship without the warmth of God, as hard as frozen snow, as regards the loving and feeling compassion for one's fellow human being in need, and sterile in its reward. Once a partnership is broken up and the desks are cleared away, the usefulness of that friendship immediately disappears, and its profit is lost. Whoever imitates my humility, though, does good to everyone for the sake of God, to enemies and friends alike, to his friends because they steadily persevere in honoring God, and to his enemies because they are God's creatures and may become good in the future. In the third place, the contemplation of my humility is a protection against rain showers and the impurities coming from the clouds. Where do clouds come from, if not from the moisture and vapors coming from the earth? When they rise to the skies due to heat, they condense in the upper regions, and, in this way, three things are produced, rain, hail, and snow. The cloud symbolizes the human body that comes from impurity. The body brings three things with it, just as clouds do. The body brings hearing, seeing, and feeling. Because the body can see, it desires the things it sees. It desires good things and beautiful forms. It desires extensive possessions. What are all these things if not a sort of rain coming from the clouds, staining the soul with a passion for hoarding, unsettling it with worries, distracting it with useless thoughts, and upsetting it over the loss of its hoarded goods. Because the body can hear, it would fain to hear of its own glory and of the world's friendship. It listens to whatever is pleasant for the body and harmful to the soul. What do all these things resemble if not swiftly melting snow? making the soul grow cold toward God and blear-eyed as to humility. Because the body has feeling, it would fain to feel its own pleasure and physical rest. What does this resemble, if not hail that is frozen from impure waters and that renders the soul unfruitful in the spiritual life, strong as regards worldly pursuits and soft as regards physical comforts? Therefore, if a person wants protection from this cloud, let him run for safety to my humility and imitate it. Through it, he is protected from the passion for seeing, and does not desire illicit things. He is protected from the pleasure of hearing, and does not listen to anything that goes against the truth. He is protected from the lust of the flesh, and does not succumb to illicit impulses. I assure you, the contemplation of my humility is like a good cloak that warms those wearing it. I mean those who not only wear it in theory, but also in practice. A physical cloak does not give any warmth unless it is worn. Likewise, my humility does no good to those who just think about it, unless each one strives to imitate it, each in his own way. Therefore, my daughter, don the cloak of humility with all your strength, since worldly women wear cloaks that are proud things on the outside but are of little use on the inside. Avoid such garments altogether, since, if the love of the world does not first become abhorrent to you, if you are not continually thinking of God's mercy toward you and your ingratitude toward him, if you do not always have in mind what he has done and what you do, and the just sentence that awaits you in return, 
you will not be able to comprehend my humility. Why did I humble myself so much, or why did I merit such favor, if not because I considered and knew myself to be nothing, and to have nothing in myself? This is also why I did not seek my own glory, but only that of my donor and creator. Therefore, daughter, take refuge in the cloak of my humility, and think of yourself as a sinner beyond all others. For even if you see others who are wicked, you do not know what their future will be like tomorrow. You do not even know their intention or their awareness of what they are doing whether they do it out of weakness or deliberately. This is why you should not put yourself ahead of anyone, and why you must not judge anyone in your heart. The Virgin's Exhortation to Her Daughter, Complaining About How Few Her Friends Are, and About How Christ Speaks to the Bride, and Describes His Sacred Words as Flowers and explains who the people are in whom such words are to bear fruit. Chapter 24 from Book 2 of Prophecies and Revelations by St. Bridget of Sweden Mary was speaking. Imagine a large army somewhere, and a person walking alongside it heavily weighed down, carrying a great load on his back and in his arms. With his eyes full of tears, he might look at the army to see if there should be someone to have compassion on him and relieve his burden. That is the way I felt. From the birth of my son until his death, my life was full of tribulation. I carried a heavy load on my back, and I persevered steadfastly in God's work and patiently bore everything that happened to me. I endured carrying a most heavy load in my arms in the sense that I suffered more sorrow of heart and tribulation than any creature. My eyes were full of tears when I contemplated the places in my son's body destined for the nails as well as his future passion, and when I saw all the prophecies I had heard foretold by the prophets being fulfilled in him. And now I look around at everyone who is in the world to see if there happens to be some who might have compassion on me, and be mindful of my sorrow. But I find very few who think about my sorrow and tribulation. This is why, my daughter, although I am forgotten and neglected by many people, you must not forget me. Look at my struggles and imitate them as far as you can. Contemplate my sorrow and tears, and be sorry that the friends of God are so few. Stand firm. Look, my son is coming. He came at once and said, I, who am speaking with you, am your God and Lord. My words are like the flowers of a fine tree. Although all the flowers spring up from the tree's one root, not all of them come to fruition. My words are like flowers that spring up from the root of divine charity. Many people take them, but they do not bear fruit in all of them, nor reach maturity in them all. Some people take them and keep them for a time, but later reject them, for they are ungrateful to my spirit. Some take and keep them, for they are full of love, and the fruit of devotion and holy conduct is produced in them. You, therefore, my bride, who are mine by divine right, must have three houses. In the first, there should be the necessary nourishment to enter the body. In the second, the clothes that clothe the body on the outside. In the third, the tools necessary for use in the house. In the first, there should be three things. First, bread. Then drink. And third, meats. In the second house there should be three things. First, linen clothing, then woolen, then the kind made by silkworms. In the third house there should also be three things. First, tools and vessels to be filled with liquids. Second, living instruments, such as horses and asses and the like, by which bodies can be conveyed. And third, 
instruments that are moved by living beings. Christ's advice to the bride about the provisions in the three houses, and about how bread stands for a good will, drink for holy forethought, and meats for divine wisdom, and about how there is no divine wisdom in irradiation, but only in the heart and in a good life. Chapter 25 I, who am speaking with you, am the Creator of all things, created by none. There was nothing before me, and there can be nothing after me, since I always was and always am. I am the Lord, whose power none can withstand, and from whom all power and sovereignty come. I speak to you as a man speaks to his wife. My wife, we should have three houses. In one of them there should be bread and drink and meats. But you might ask, what does this bread mean? Do I mean the bread that is on the altar? This is indeed bread, prior to the words, this is my body. But, once the words have been spoken, it is not bread but the body that I took from the Virgin, and that was truly crucified on the cross. But here I do not mean that bread. The bread that we should store in our house is a good and sincere will. Physical bread, if it is pure and clean, has two good effects. First, it fortifies and gives strength to all the veins and arteries and muscles. Second, it absorbs any inner impurity, bringing it along for removal as it goes out, and so the person is cleansed. In this way, a pure will gives strength. If a person wishes for nothing but the things of God, works for nothing but the glory of God, desires with every desire to leave the world and to be with God, this intention strengthens him in goodness, increases his love for God makes the world loathsome to him, fortifies his patience, and reinforces his hope of inheriting glory to the extent that he cheerfully embraces everything that happens to him. In the second place, a good will removes every impurity. What is the impurity harmful to the soul if not pride, greed, and lust? However, when the impurity of pride or of some other vice enters the mind, it will leave, provided the person reasons in the following way. Pride is meaningless, since it is not the recipient who should be praised for goods given him, but the giver. Greed is meaningless, since all the things of earth will be left behind. Lust is nothing but filth. Therefore I do not desire these things, but want to follow the will of my God, whose reward will never come to an end, whose good gifts never grow old. Then every temptation to pride or greed will leave him, and he will persevere in his good intention of doing good. The drink we should have in our houses is holy forethought about everything to be done. Physical drink has two effects. First, it aids good digestion. When a person proposes to do something good, and, before doing it, considers to himself and turns carefully over in his mind what glory will come out of it for God, what benefit is it to his neighbor, what advantage to his soul, and does not want to do it unless he judges there be some divine usefulness in his work, then that proposed work will turn out well or be, so to speak, well digested. Then, if any indiscretion occurs in the work he is doing, it is quickly detected. If anything is wrong, it is quickly corrected, and his work will be upright and rational and edifying for others. A person who does not show holy forethought in his work, and does not seek benefit to souls or the glory of God, even if his work turns out well for a time, Nevertheless, it will come to nothing in the end. In the second place, drink quenches thirst. What kind of thirst is worse than the sin of base greed and anger? If a person thinks beforehand what usefulness will come of it, how wretchedly it will end, what reward there will be if he makes resistance, then that base thirst is soon quenched through God's grace. 
zealous love for God, and good desires fail him, and joy arises because he has not done what came into his mind. He will examine the occasion and how he can avoid in the future those things by which he was almost tripped up. Had he not had forethought, and he will be more careful in the future about avoiding such things. My bride, this is the drink that should be stored in our pantry. Third, there should also be meats there. These have two effects. First, they taste better in the mouth and are better for the body than just bread alone. Second, they make for tenderer skin and better blood than if there were only bread in drink. Spiritual meat has a like effect. What do these meats symbolize? Divine wisdom, of course. Wisdom tastes very good to a person who has a good will and wants nothing but what God wants, showing holy forethought, doing nothing until he knows it to be for God's glory. Now, you might ask, what is divine wisdom? For many people are simple and only know one prayer, the Our Father, and not even that correctly. Others are very erudite and have wide knowledge. Is this divine wisdom? By no means. Divine wisdom is not precisely to be found in erudition, but in the heart and a good life. That person is wise who reflects carefully on the path toward death and how he will die and on his judgment after death. That person has the meats of wisdom and the taste of a good will and holy forethought, who detaches himself from the vanity and superfluities of the world, and contents himself with the bare necessities, and struggles in the love of God according to his abilities. When a person reflects on his death and on his nakedness at death, when a person examines God's terrible court of judgment, where nothing is hidden and nothing is remitted without a punishment, when he also reflects on the instability and vanity of the world, will he not then rejoice and sweetly savor in his heart the surrender of his will to God, together with his abstinence from sin? Is it not his body strengthened and his blood improved? That is, is not every weakness of his soul, such as sloth and moral dissolution, driven away, and the blood of divine love rejuvenated? This is because he reasons rightly that an eternal good is to be loved rather than a perishable one. Therefore, divine wisdom is not precisely to be found in erudition, but in good works, since many are wise in a worldly way, and after their own desires, but altogether foolish with regard to God's will and commandments, and the disciplining of their body. Such people are not wise, but foolish and blind, for they understand perishable things that are useful for the moment. But they despise and forget the things of eternity. Others are foolish with regard to worldly delights and reputation, but wise in considering the things that are of God and they are fervent in his service. Such people are truly wise, for they savor the precepts and will of God. They have truly been enlightened, and keep their eyes open, in that they are always considering in what way they may reach the true life and light. Others, however, walk in darkness, and it seems to them more delightful to be in darkness than to inquire about the way by which they might come to the light. Therefore, my bride, let us store up these three things in our houses, namely a good will, holy forethought, and divine wisdom. These are the things that give us reason to rejoice. Although I speak my advice to you, by you I mean all my chosen ones in the world, since the righteous soul is my bride, for I am her creator and redeemer. Welcome to the Virgo Potens YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, give it a like. I also invite you to subscribe to this channel so that you won't miss new content. Please prayerfully consider supporting my work by becoming a patron of Virgo Potens on Patreon and or by buying one of my books. 
My ebooks are available on Amazon as well as on the Apple Bookstore. For those who prefer a physical copy rather than an ebook, my book Spiritual Warfare Know Thy Enemy is also available as a paperback on Amazon. If you are interested in making a one time contribution, I suggest that you do so by simply buying one of my books. I am thankful for your support. Links to Patreon and to my books will be posted in the comments section of this video. The continuation of this work isn't possible without you. Lastly, and most importantly, please pray for me. May the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you. Thank <laughs> you.